Well, here's a question that's not totally related, but you might be a good person for this. What is quantum computing? Now, I've, I've, I keep hearing about yep. this. That it's one of the big breakthroughs in, in computers is going to be quantum computing. Right. I'm almost the right guy. I'm not completely the right guy. Right. I actually um, did teach a course at Caltech that involved quantum computing, so I'm, well, yeah, I'm above average. <laughs> Definitely the best guy ever, right? But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so quantum mechanics, this is the book that I'm writing right now uh, that's going to be out a year from now called Something Deeply Hidden. It'll be about quantum mechanics, and the goal of the book will be to make quantum mechanics understandable to everybody and convince them that quantum mechanics really does imply the existence of multiple worlds where things look very much the same, except for tiny differences. And one way of thinking about what quantum mechanics says is in classical mechanics, which is what came before quantum mechanics, let, let's imagine you have a bit, right? That is something is either zero or one, right? One piece of information. In quantum mechanics, you have a quantum bit, a qubit as they call it, very clever. So the difference is that instead of it being a zero or a one, like it would be classically, quantum mechanically, it is in some superposition of zero and one. It's some combination of a little bit zero, a little bit one. Mm. And it's not that you don't know which one it is. It's that it really is both. It might be 90% zero and 10% one or something like that. So take that fact, number one, okay? Fact number two is that quantum mechanics has a thing called entanglement, which means that if you have two bits, classically, so you have zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, right? Four different possibilities. So quantum mechanics says it's not that this one bit is in a combination of zero and one, and this other bit is also in a combination of zero and one. It's that the two-bit system is in a combination of zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, right? So it might be that it's 50% zero, zero, and 50% one, one. So you don't know what either bit is, but you know they're the same, right? Okay. So that's entanglement. So you take these two ideas, that the, you have a combination of zeros and ones rather than just one or the other, and the, the different bits can be entangled with each other. And then you just say, well, what is a computer? A computer is something that takes bits in, does manipulations, and spits out the answer, right? You solve problems. You, that's what's literally going on in your computer is a bunch of zeros and ones being pushed around. So a quantum computer is pushing around a bunch of qubits, right? A bunch of spinning particles or something like that. The spin of a particle that can either be spinning clockwise or counterclockwise is a qubit. And so these particles can interact with each other. They can become entangled. And you invent a quantum algorithm, right? Like there's algorithms for you know finding the area of a surface or something like that. Factoring large numbers, you know, solving the shortest distance between two different points. You can do this using the rules of quantum mechanics instead of the rules of classical mechanics. And the belief, which is not yet 100% established, but we think is true, is that there are some problems that are really, really hard to solve for a classical computer, which means that you can easily make the problem long enough that it would take the lifetime of the universe to solve it on a classical computer, which quantum computers can solve quite quickly and efficiently. And so it's... We're not. We haven't proven that. That's not a mathematically why precise. Is the, why statement. would they think that quantum computers would be able to solve it quicker? There's more information in the quantum computer. Like if you have two bits, zero, 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 one, etc. There's only four things it can be, right? If you have a quantum computer, there's an infinite number of things it can be, because it's any combination of those four things, right? Ten percent this, twenty percent that. So there's right. like a, a continuum of possibilities. It's it's analog rather than digital in some sense. And so what you, what you can do, you know, the, the quantum computer can just sort of take advantage of that extra power um, to look, I mean, because of this entanglement, what, this, is, this is, I'm going to get in trouble with my quantum computing friends because it's not quite fair. But roughly speaking, rather than manipulating bit by bit, because of the entanglement between the bits, the quantum computer can move all the bits a little bit at once. So let's say that you're, you're searching for something in a list, right? A very elementary uh, computer science program is I'm giving you a list, find an element that is equal to a certain number, right? right. It sounds easy, but if that list is 10 trillion things long, that's hard, right? So what the quantum computer can do is say, take every element in the list, nudge it a little bit towards zero if it's the wrong answer and towards one if it's the right answer. And you don't know where it is in the list, but you can do that nudging over and over again. And at the end of the day, you look for where, where is the one, and it's very easy to find. Mm. So you can get the answer much quicker, it is believed. And so things like 
cryptography, privacy, right, are dramatically changed by this because if one of the things that we think quantum computers should be able to do faster is factor large numbers, which is the the the, the, the difficulty in factoring large numbers is the uh, basis for much modern cryptography. Uh, but also simulating systems that were just too difficult to simulate. You know, just, just it took too much computer power to do it. Now maybe we can do it because nature is truly quantum mechanical at, at the core. It turns out to be very hard because the problem is you have all these bits. If you touch one of them, if the outside world bumps into one of them, right, like a cosmic ray or an atom hits it, mm -hmm. the whole entanglement is ruined between everything. So it's very, very delicate. And that's what the, you know, right now um, they're, they're working on systems of, let's say, dozens of qubits entangled at once. You would, you would like it to be way more than that. Because you can store an enormous amount of information in these things. And uh, if, if it works, it's, I think it'll be way better at computing if it works. I'm not at all sure that quantum computers will be efficient or cost effective or anything like that in the near term. But, you know, doing c computations faster is something that a lot of people want to be able to do. So right now they're working with dozens of qubits and w what's preventing them from expanding that? Or are they doing it slowly to sort of make sure that it all works correctly and get a, 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 an accurate model? Yeah. So the, the problem is if you have a qubit, it can be in a combination of zero or one, right? Any combination whatsoever. But as soon as you look at it, you never see the combination. You see zero or you see one. That's it. And you've ruined, you've erased this pre-existing combination, right? If you see zero, now it's in the state zero. Right. If you see one, it's in the state one. So if you have a group of many, many qubits, what I mean by look at is literally anything else in the world bumping into it. So mm -hmm. like if, like I said, if photons hit it, if particles, uh, you know, if, if molecules of, of air and oxygen or nitrogen bump into the qubit, that'll count as an observation, and it will collapse, as we say. It collapses the wave function, and then all of your quantum information is ruined. So uh, you have to make them sort of very cold, very isolated, very shielded from external influences. And the more qubits you add, the harder that is to do. Ooh. Now, is there a proof of concept to this? Yep. They have working quantum computers. Oh. Um, I, I forget. There was a joke. Uh, Scott Aronson, who's a friend of mine who's a genius uh, theoretical computer scientist, used to joke that the quantum computers are able to to say that the number 15 is equal to 5 times 3 with very high probability. <laughs> that was the state <laughs> of the art. I think they're able to say that 21 equals 3 times 7 with very high probability now. But uh, what you would like to say is, you know, some 100-digit number is the product of, of two other numbers. They're not able to do that right now. Now, what are they looking at with this when, when, they're, when they're looking in terms of uh, the future of this stuff? What are they, how do they want to implement this? Lots of different ways, actually. Like you know, the actual physical technology that they're using. Some people are using uh, atoms. Some people are using sort of um, uh, features of condensed matter systems, like two-dimensional systems where electrons are moving slowly and can wind around each other and things like that. This is way beyond what I actually uh, know about. But also, you know, the sort of side light of this is that this existence of entanglement. Um, is kind of a shared information between two different things in a way that classical physics just would not allow. And that's interesting and exciting because it opens up ways uh, for, you know, for sharing information that other people can't get to because you have some information, your friend has some information, but it's, it, you need both pieces of it to get to it, right? Um, Seth Lloyd, who's a, another friend of mine, an MIT professor, said that he was he tells a story where he was in a hot tub with the uh, Google guys, right, with Sergey and, and Larry and, you know, the, the heads of Google, the founders. And he said, oh, I came up with this brilliant new idea where we can use quantum mechanics, build a quantum computer so that a person who does a search, a Google search using this quantum computer, they can do a search and they can get their answer, but it is literally impossible for anyone else to ever know what they searched for. Mm. And the Google guys were like very excited and they went away. The next day they came back and said, oh, we realized this is the opposite of our business model. <laughs> like we, it's really important to us that we know what you search for. Yeah, right? right? <laughs> so, I mean, that's the whole thing with them. The yeah. Google ads, yeah. Google, Google AdSense. Right. When you go to another website, it shows you, oh, Sean's been looking at, you know, Lenovo laptops. Yeah, Bam, exactly. there they are. Yeah, and they follow you around on all your yeah, other devices, right? It's weird. Your cookies. Creepy. But yeah, so in quantum in quantum computing, there's, there's quantum money, there's quantum cryptography, uh, there's quantum eavesdropping, things like that. So it, it's just, a, it's 
it's easy to speculate about. I, I would not say the actual technology is very far advanced right now, but I can't tell you how quickly it will happen. Well, wouldn't someone like Google just have to adjust? Because prior to these Google ads, you never really knew what someone was interested in unless they took surveys or unless they had purchasing history or there had to be some way that you could. Now they're just yeah. detecting off of searches, and that's what their business model is. But that doesn't mean they can't come up with a better new business model. They'll have to adapt, but they are not uh, in the business of making that happen. Right? No. In Especially fact, they, now it's so effective. If they were really smart, they would have given Seth $100,000 and say, tell no one about this ever again. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Is that enough? Yeah. <laughs> we found out with the Stormy Daniels case that right. $100,000 doesn't buy a lot of Two-thirds of a Stormy Daniel. Mm. Right. <laughs> what do you think um, they'll, like, what would be the first way they try to use something like this? They try to use quantum computing. I don't know. I think that um, you know the people who are really interested in it now are uh, the NSA and the DOD, right? Uh, National Security Agency mm. and the Department of Defense, because secret messages are the right. most obvious thing, um, cracking codes and things mm -hmm. like that. That's like the killer app that we know about right now. Um, physicists, of course, want to use it to simulate quantum mechanical systems, to learn about uh, the behavior of materials, like maybe you'll build a better superconductor or something like that right away. Maybe you'll do better designing of your genetically engineered DNA on a quantum computer, right? Like, there's sort of the generic thought that you'll be able to do computations faster, that's interesting. Um, then there's more specific things, like if, if the system you're trying to simulate is itself quantum mechanical, then simulating it on a quantum computer might be the way to go. Mm. Yeah, to most people that just went, woo, <laughs> right over the head. What is? What are these guys talking? Quantum is so weird. Like one of the things that you said earlier you were when you were talking about quantum, you were talking about worlds that are very similar yeah. but with very small differences. Right, yes. So, uh, yeah, I forget whether we talked about this uh, last time, but, you know, there. so there's this whole version of quantum mechanics. Well, I mean, let me back up because we have okay. time, right? Sure. Quantum mechanics is weird because, among other things, it is by far the most successful theory of physics ever invented. We've tested it to enormous precision, right? There's n zero evidence that the quantum mechanics is in any way not right, but we don't understand it. We don't, we like, not just people on the street, like professional physicists don't know exactly what quantum mechanics says. Right? So how do you practice it? Well, we have a recipe. We have a black box, right? The way that I, I, I put it in the book is, imagine you had a website you could go to and you would say, you know, if I threw a ball with a certain velocity in a certain direction, how far would it go? And it would give you the answer right away. Depending upon Does the atmosphere. That, yeah. You put, you put all the details in, it gives you the answer. Does that count as you knowing the laws of physics? You know, no. You just have a black box, right? Right. Well, that's what quantum mechanics is right now. If we set up an experiment, we can say what the probability of every answer is going to be, every outcome. But if you say, well, why? What happened? We don't know. Or right. we don't agree. Like, different people disagree with each other. And so this version of quantum, there's different versions that try to answer this question, what's really going on beneath the surface, right? What's, what's the deep down story of the world? And one of these stories is the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. And it was invented by a graduate student, Hugh Everett, in the 1950s, who was instantly kicked out of physics. Because, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, it, there's a long, unglorious history of uh, people trying to think deeply about quantum mechanics and being shunned in the community for doing so. <laughs> because we've set up this weird thing where, I mean, there was literally a memo that went around the major physics journal in the United States said, we will not even look at papers to try to think about the foundations of quantum mechanics. Uh, it's embarrassing. It's terrible. It's like <sighs> we, we need to do like real work, like shut up and calculate. You know, we need to build bombs and things, not think about the nature of reality, which I think is very much antithetical to what physicists should be doing. But anyway, so what many world says is, well, so when we, when we do talk about quantum mechanics, well, let's say we have a qubit, we have a spinning particle, right? We have this combination of spinning clockwise and counterclockwise. And so we call that the wave function. The wave function is just, it's 10% clockwise, 20, you know, 90% counterclockwise or whatever. So to every possible measurement outcome, you give me a number, and that number is basically how I figure out the probability of that measurement outcome coming true, and that's the wave function. So there, for a long time, people thought, well, this is just a trick. This is just like some, it, it characterizes our inability to be precise, right? We have a probability of this, a probability of that. But someday, they hoped, Einstein, for example, had this hope that we'll have a better theory and we'll know exactly how to predict everything with perfect precision. So what Everett says is, no, 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 it's the other way around. 
um, this wave function is reality. That's the whole world, right? That's what reality is. It is a superposition, a combination of all the different possible outcomes. It's not any one outcome. There's no such thing as where the electron is. It's all spread out. And the problem with that is that when you look at the electron spinning, you never see it as a combination of spinning clockwise and counterclockwise. You always see one or the other. And Everett says that's because you have a wave function. You live as a superposition of different possibilities. And when you look at the electron, what happens is before there was you and there's an electron in a combination of counterclockwise and clockwise. Afterward, there is the electron was spinning clockwise and you saw it spinning clockwise. Plus, that's 10%. And then 90%, the electron was spinning counterclockwise and you saw it spinning counterclockwise. And both possibilities are real but they're separate. They've branched off from each other. They've gone their own ways. They're separate versions of the world, separate copies of reality. That's why it's called the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. 